Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I uh, uh, get to your questions, I'm going to welcome Ambassador Cindy Dyer, the ambassador at large for the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons to the podium. She's going to give you, you some remarks on uh, the State Department's traffic in, Trafficking in Persons report, which was released today. Uh, take some questions, and then after um, she's taking your questions, I'll come back and be happy to talk about anything else. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. I am pleased to join you for today's briefing. Uh, earlier today, Secretary Blinken released the State Department's 2023 Trafficking in Persons Report, or the TIP Report, which examines government's efforts to meet the Trafficking Victims Protection Act's minimum standards to combat human trafficking using a 3P framework of protecting victims prosecuting traffickers and preventing this crime by dismantling the systems that make it easier for traffickers to operate. Now in its 23rd year, the report reflects the U.S. government's commitment to global leadership on this key human rights issue, law enforcement and national security issue. It is our principal diplomatic and diagnostic tool to guide our engagements with foreign governments on human trafficking. The theme of this year's report also reflects our commitment to what is called the fourth P, partnership. This year's TIP report introduction highlights and emphasizes the importance of partnership, shares lessons learned, and highlights elements and examples of effective partnerships for governments, international organizations, civil society, private sector entities, and other stakeholders. For the second consecutive year, we partnered with the Human Trafficking Expert Consultant Network to provide content and feedback throughout the process of drafting the introduction. These consultants have a range of expertise related to combating human trafficking, working with marginalized communities, trauma recovery, and resiliency, mental health care, and survivor leadership and they provide expertise and input into the development of Department of State anti-trafficking policies, strategies, and products, both in the United States and abroad. We also included a special segment called Survivor Insights, perspectives from those with lived experience of human trafficking, written by network consultants in their own voices, Collaborating with survivors as equal partners is critical to understanding the realities of human trafficking and establishing effective victim-centered, trauma-informed, and culturally competent anti-trafficking policies and strategies. I thank them for their thoughtful and meaningful contributions to this year's TIP report and for sharing their expertise with us. This year's TIP report elevates important cross-cutting issues, including the non-punishment principle, unscrupulous manufacturers concealing forced labor, the vulnerability of boys and men to human trafficking, and online recruitment of vulnerable populations for forced labor. And I want to highlight one rapidly growing and troubling trend forced labor as a result of cyber scam operations. Traffickers have leveraged pandemic-related economic hardships, increased global youth unemployment, and international travel restrictions to exploit thousands of adults and children in a multi-billion dollar industry over the last two years in these schemes. Many people have responded to job offers for what they think are legitimate work in IT, in casinos, or other seemingly legitimate businesses. Often, these individuals are forced to participate in cyber scams under impossible quota arrangements that make them increasingly indebted to traffickers. Traffickers use this debt to exploit victims in forced labor and sex trafficking, including in special economic zones, primarily throughout Southeast Asia, but ensnaring nationals from at least 35 countries or territories. 
we will continue to engage governments and authorities on the importance of proactively identifying and assisting victims and protecting people from fraudulent recruitment schemes like these. And we aim to raise awareness on this trend through this report. We will bring assistance to bear when we can support government and civil society efforts to address this issue and protect victims. In the country narratives, this year's report assessed 188 countries and territories, including the United States. Overall, there are 24 tier ranking upgrades and 20 downgrades compared with 21 upgrades and 18 downgrades last year. There were two upgrades to Tier 1, 19 upgrades to Tier 2, and three upgrades to Tier 2 watch list from Tier 3. Half of this year's 24 upgrades were in Sub-Saharan Africa. Downgrades this year highlight systemic gaps governments not reporting their anti-trafficking efforts, not screening for trafficking indicators, not tackling forced labor adequately, not effectively monitoring protection systems, and not equitably implementing anti-trafficking efforts. Across all data points included in the global totals, tracking prosecutions, convictions, and victims identified, there were increases reported as compared to the 2022 totals. Prosecutions were higher than the years immediately preceding the pandemic. Convictions continued to increase and victim identifications increased by nearly 25,000, although neither convictions nor victims identified were yet back to pre-pandemic levels and highs reported in 2019. Globally, efforts to prosecute and convict labor traffickers and identify labor trafficking victims were also notably higher than prior years, which we attribute both to ongoing improvements in government efforts in this area, as well as better government data collection and reporting. Finally, before I open it up for questions, I wanna highlight the eight tip report heroes who have devoted their lives to the fight against human trafficking and who the department is honoring today. The 2023 tip report heroes come from Brazil, Cambodia, Iraq, Nigeria, Pakistan, Peru, and Venezuela. We hope you saw the live stream with the award presentations and Yvonne Idahosa's remarks on behalf of the group. These individuals inspire each of us to do more to advance the global fight against human trafficking and protect the victims and survivors of this crime. The honorees will engage with American communities and organizations committed to ending human trafficking in Boston and Miami through the U.S. Department of State's International Visitor Leadership Program, IVLP. I hope everyone has the opportunity to hear their stories of how they've used partnerships, often courageously and creatively, to advance our shared fight against trafficking and elevate the role of survivors. I am incredibly grateful to them for their efforts. Let me end by saying I am so profoundly thankful to our colleagues at embassies around the world and throughout the department who worked diligently to gather data and analyze trafficking trends and efforts year round. A special thanks to the tireless team in the Trafficking in Persons Office who led the effort to produce this report. This truly is a year long collaborative effort that I am so honored to share with the world today. Thank you so much and I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, thanks, Ambassador, for doing this. Uh, two questions, if I may. Uh, the, the first is there was a particular mention, well, the Secretary mentioned, uh, on trafficking of boys. And I wonder if you could, uh, I, I hadn't read the report last year, so I don't know if this is new to this year or if it's something that's been ongoing for a couple of years. But if you could give us a little bit more um, you know, substance highlight on, on, on that particular aspect. And the second question is, since the report includes the United States, I assume the U.S. made the first tier, uh, and so I'd like to have your assessment of human trafficking in the U.S. 
uh, currently. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. And you're correct. This year, we did a highlight on the often hidden victims that are men and boys. Um, men and boys have always been victims and can be victims, but they are frequently overlooked. Frequently, folks think of a trafficking victim as a woman or a girl, but in fact, all adults and all children can be victims, including men and boys. Men and boys frequently are less likely to seek services and self-identify. And what's even more troubling is that when they do, services are not always available for them. Some services are exclusive for women and girls. And so we wanted to highlight this to make sure that we are using appropriate screening. All individuals can be victims, and that in addition to screening, and identifying, we need to make sure that victim-centered, trauma-informed services are available to all victims, including men and boys. Uh, to your second question regarding the United States, um, our office does assess very deeply United States efforts to address trafficking in persons. This year, we did assess the United States efforts as a tier one because they were increasing. We looked at this government's efforts this reporting period compared to last reporting period, and we saw a number of increases, including the number of victims who are served with federal funds, the number of T visas that are issued, and reducing the time that it takes to get a visa. Of course, as with all Tier 1 countries, we have areas for improvement to make. One of those improvements is making sure that all of our services are available to men and boys. Um, we need to do a better job of identifying labor trafficking because so often people are really looking for sex trafficking and we need to make sure that we're looking for all victims of trafficking. So while we did assess ourselves at a Tier 1, the U.S. narrative is detailed and uh, it provides not only areas where we did a great job, but areas where we have improvement. Yeah, you, you called me yesterday or so you mistake. Please collect my name. All right, thank you. Uh, regarding uh, trafficking, human trafficking in North Korean defectors, what action is the United States taking against the Chinese government, which is committing human trafficking and the human rights violations against North Korean defectors? And how much does the United States care about these? Thank you. Thank you for your question. The United States cares deeply about all victims of trafficking. Our, our chief reason for putting so much time and effort into this report is so that it serves as both a diagnostic tool and a diplomatic tool. We really use this during our engagements with other countries. We use it to try to get better services and improve every country's response. As it pertains to um, the PRC, you, you can see in the TIP report that we assessed that China is not meeting the minimum standards for addressing human trafficking, and they are not making significant efforts to do so. That would put them on tier three. That's the bottom tier. Additionally, to your point, we found that they're engaging in a policy or pattern of trafficking. We want countries to do a good job and certainly not to actually engage in bad practices, which the narrative clearly points out that China is doing, especially the policy or pattern of forced labor through the continued arbitrary detention of Uyghurs, ethnic Kazakhs, ethnic Kyrgyz, and members of other religious and minority groups. Additionally, the PRC is actually taking efforts to try to make it more difficult for us to determine if their supply chain is clean, for us to determine if forced labor is occurring. Um, we are aggressively monitoring this. We are also monitoring the, um, the government's use of the Belt and Road Initiative, where they are um, potentially using their forced labor of their own citizens as well as, as host countries. So we are definitely focusing on this really heavily in the report. Thank you, thank you so much for coming down here. Can we speak to um, some of the new vulnerabilities that Russia's war against Ukraine has created and its long and short-term impacts? 
both in the region and globally, please. Thanks so much. Um, thank you so much for asking about that. We remain deeply concerned of human trafficking faced by all of those fleeing the war in Ukraine. Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine forced more than 8 million people to flee Ukraine and displaced 1.5 million more within its borders as of May 2023. Um, we are actively watching and observing, we were, we were glad that governments and organizations have actually identified relatively few confirmed cases of human trafficking among those refugees. However, we remain very concerned and are working closely with our allies in Europe to really vigorously monitor this system. And we are particularly concerned about the trafficking also within Ukraine due to Russia's invasion, particularly for children and internally displaced persons. That um, the narrative in Ukraine is very thorough, um, very well researched. I encourage you to read it. It will include much more specific information. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, you talked about that uh, one of the persons that you invited to hear is from Iraq. And we know that, according to some reports, that Iraq has recorded an increase in human trafficking crimes where the victims are women, girls, children, and also LGBT persons. Then, due to the collapse of the economy of Iran currency and also the conflicts in Syria, this has led to influx hundreds of the women and girls to go to the Kurdistan region of Iraq and also to Iraq, and they are suffering from the human trafficking in the cafes and also uh, in the hotels. Then what efforts do you have in this area in Syria, in Iraq, and also to prevent and to mitigate this, the consequences of this human trafficking? Um, as, as you may have seen, Iraq in this year's report was downgraded to tier two watch list um, because it does not meet the minimum standards and it didn't ind indicate overall increasing efforts to address the very problems that you mentioned compared to the year before. Specifically, the federal government reported identifying fewer trafficking victims despite the, the concern that you have raised. They're identifying fewer trafficking victims and they actually did not report law enforcement or all victim identification data. This is obviously concerning for us. We also are concerned because the federal government lacked <laughs> adequate protection services for the victims that were identified. Um, so we have flagged these issues in the report. I also feel like because I just delivered some bad news, let me deliver some good. We had two amazing tip report heroes from Iraq today, a husband and wife team who established an NGO uh, called FATE that is serving um, Iraqi victims, but also individuals, as you pointed out, who are in Iraq who came from other places. This is an, uh, an organization that they're serving all, whether they are Iraqi citizens or not. So that bad news is tempered with some good news, um, and thank you for your question. Thank you, Ambassador. My name is Ariana. I cover for Africa. So I saw in your, I heard in your remarks you mentioned Africa sub-Saharan having a downgrade in, in traffic in, in person. Can you tell us what seems to be the biggest problem in Africa when it comes to uh, traffic in person and what the governments in Africa are doing to solve this problem? Well, um, thank you very much for that question. And, and to be clear, uh, I actually was saying that of the 24 upgrades that um, were given in this TIP report um, compared to last year, there were 21 of the 24 upgrades. It's actually good news, 12 of those upgrades were in Sub-Saharan Africa. So there, that, there is a bit of a good news story there. Um, we carefully looked at each of those countries. Um, some of those countries, it is important to note, they were on what is called tier two watch list and they had been on that watch list for a long enough time that they couldn't remain. They had to go up or they had to go down. And fortunately, many of those countries exhibited enough positive efforts compared to what they had done the year before that we assessed that they could go up. And so that accounted for 12 of the 24 upgrades. And so we, I really think this is a good news story. 
Um, similarly, one of our amazing tip heroes is from Sub-Saharan Africa. Yvonne Idahosa is from Nigeria. She has, she's, ba she's, she's based in, um, her, her office is based in uh, Benin City, which is a real hub for many uh, trafficking victims, specifically women and girls being trafficked out of Nigeria. She's doing amazing work with her organization, Pathfinders, and so that's another bright spot. Among the countries that are doing well in terms of uh, traffic in person, is Angola and in Mozambique part of those countries? Um, I would have to look up. I don't know if I have the specific information on uh, Angola and Mozambique. I know that we had one upgrade to a tier one country that was um, the Seychelles actually went up to tier one, which is while, as we've established, they, it, all tier one countries still have improvements to make, it's the highest tier. And so that was um, a good news story. But tell me the, the specific country that you wanted to ask about. Angola and Mozambique. Okay. Um, with regard to Mozambique, I, I do know that that is one that was downgraded. Mozambique was downgraded from tier two to tier two watch list. And the reason that occurred is because Mozambique did not meet the minimum standards as set out in the TVPA, but they, um, they were making some significant efforts, but they didn't demonstrate overall increasing efforts. Specifically, the government did not identify any trafficking victims, and they lacked adequate procedures for frontline officials to even screen for those trafficking victims. And for the seventh consecutive year, the government did not adopt its draft national referral mechanism, which would set in place the screening procedures. Um, these are obviously some areas for improvement. We hope that they're able to do that during the year. I'll take one more for the ambassador. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Jareed Afridi from Pakistan. Uh, so uh, I would like to know first, uh, did Pakistan wish tear did it fall in? And secondly, we had a lady from Pakistan who uh, went through human trafficking and she was a national hockey player. And she left her child and went. So all these people, uh, they each have very sad stories. And today this incident of Greece adds to this whole sadness. But from Pakistan point of view, I have, uh, I, I, like in this 23 years of journalism, this is like these human traffickers, we never hear severe punishments for them. We never hear their deportation. We never hear they're like putting them in life, uh, you know, for the whole life in jail. What is the reason for that? You actually bring up a really good point because we do believe that in addition to identifying victims and referring them to services, traffickers will continue to operate as long as they can do so with impunity. It's a financial crime and as long as they can do it with impunity, then they will continue to do so, which is why one of the key areas that the Trafficking in Persons Report covers is not only was there a prosecution, but also was there a conviction? And was there a conviction that resulted in a punishment that is appropriate to the severity of the crime? Pakistan definitely has room for improvement in this area. One good thing on the good news is the honoree, the tip honoree that we had from Pakistan is actually a government official. He is someone who is in the police department who is working really hard to create a more coordinated response between the police and the prosecutors and the service providers so that victims can tell their story, so that prosecutors can bring that forward and so that they're more likely to get a conviction. Um, his name is Zahir, and he was really inspiring. Uh, I hope maybe you have an opportunity to talk to him while you're here. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay. Get my house in order here. Okay. On to other topics. Let's start. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, on North Korea, uh, I think North Korea fired two ballistic missiles into the East Coast today. What is the State Department's reaction to this? And uh, 
White House National Security Council uh, announced that uh, this is a violation from the UN Security Council. What is your reaction? I would say that the United States, along with our allies in the region, Japan, uh, the Republic of Korea, condemned today's DPRK missile launches. These launches are a clear violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. <clears throat> they demonstrate the threat of DPRK's unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile uh, <clears throat> programs posed to the region, to international peace and security, and to the global nonproliferation regime. I will also note that today um, uh, the United States imposed sanctions on two DPRK individuals for supporting the DPRK's unlawful weapons of mass destruction uh, and missile programs. So we will continue to uh, take action to hold uh, 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 people accountable for such activities. China continues to use its veto power on sanctions against North Korea in the UN Security Council resolution. Will the Secretary Blinken discuss this issue with his counterpart in the China during his visit to China? I'm not going to preview the exact issues that the Secretary will raise, other than to say that we do expect him to raise a whole host of bilateral, bilateral issues, regional security issues. There will be issues um, where we have concerns with actions that China has taken in areas um, uh, where we hope uh, that we can potentially work together, um, but we'll wait until after the meetings to read out exactly what he, ha he said. Okay. Matt, do you want to? No, I'll I come back to you. No, sorry. Okay. I was on the um, phone. Go ahead. I wanted to ask about um, Kosovo and Serbia. Um, there's been uh, more tensions on the border, um, including uh, Serbs arresting three policemen. Um, and so far, I guess, in terms of statements from from U.S., uh, we've seen is, is mainly criticizing the, the the Kosovan prime minister. I wonder, um, you know, where where do you stand on 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 these tensions as they're increasing, and, and you know, what kind of engagements uh, yeah. can you talk to us about? Um, let me make clear that um, uh, our expectations for both parties, which is we believe that Kosovo and Serbia must both take immediate steps to de-escalate tensions. Uh, that includes the unconditional release of the three recently detained Kosovo police officers. We believe both parties must follow the three-point plan that has been outlined by the EU without delay. Uh, as part of this, as we've spoken to before, Prime Minister Kurdi and his government must ensure that elected mayors carry out their transitional duties from alternate locations and withdraw police forces from the vicinity. Um, we continue to continue to condemn the unacceptable violence against NATO-led K-4 troops, against law enforcement and journalists. And I will say in terms of a, a path forward, we continue to be engaged um, both directly with, uh, with both parties as well as with our uh, partners in the region. Secretary Blinken has had conversations with partners in the region about this. Councillor Chalet has had direct conversations, uh, as have others uh, from the State Department. Can we expect um, any, you know, any any further actions going forward? Like, you know, would you, would you be looking at um, uh, using sanctions, perhaps, to as a as a tool on this? I, I don't want to preview any potential uh, actions right now. Our focus is making clear our expectations to both parties that they uh, both take immediate steps to exacerbate tensions uh, and follow the three point plan that's been outlined by the EU. Uh, near New Swansea Castle in Germany. It was apparently um, a, one American is accused of attacking two other tourists who were also from the United States and killing one of them. Is this a case the State Department is tracking and is the State Department offering assistance to the victims? Uh, we are aware of the incidents uh, involving multiple individuals in Germany. The consulate in Munich, the U.S. consulate in Munich, is monitoring the situation closely, uh, is in contact with uh, authorities, but due to privacy considerations, uh, I'm unable to offer any, any further comment at this time. Can I also ask quickly about the two Americans found dead at a luxury hotel in Mexico? Uh, the State Department has said that they are closely monitoring local authorities' investigation into the matter. So far, does the investigation appear to be proceeding as regular? Are there any irregularities there? Uh, I'm not aware of any irregularities. Uh, we, we can confirm the death, uh, unfortunately, those two U.S. citizens. Uh, we offer our sincerest condolences to the families uh, for their loss. We are closely monitoring the investigation into the cause of, the, of death. Uh, and we stand ready to provide any consular, uh, uh, any appropriate consular assistance. Uh, and I don't have anything further at this time. Alex. Excellent. Uh, two questions. Uh, curiously, if you have been uh, uh, keeping track on movements of Russian nuclear weapons, now that Belarus have proclaimed, President claims that he has some of them. And do you also expect that Russia will retain control over those weapons? Because he says he, he, he can use them. 
so I, I won't speak to, um, uh, to, to the issue of control. Um, what I will say about that is we, of course, seen the reports going back for some time now about the Russia-Belarus arrangement. We'll continue to monitor uh, how it unfolds and the implications. Uh, as we've said before, and it continues to be the case, we have not seen any reason to adjust our own nuclear posture, nor any indications that Russia is preparing to use uh, a nuclear weapon. With respect to Belarus, it's yet another uh, example of Lukashenko making irresponsible and provocative choices to cede more control over Belarus to the Kremlin against the will of the Belarusian people. And for Russia, it's yet another irresponsible move by the Kremlin. Um, my second question, I want to give you a chance to expand a little bit on um, what you tweeted about as a, as a general I mean, yesterday. Um, its implications, uh, as you know, as a general denies uh, what, what you said uh, was happening yesterday. And uh, overall, broadly speaking, what are you guys doing to prevent this sort of incident from happening in future? Um, I, 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 miss, I sort of missed the first part you, of your question. You tweeted yesterday that you know, there was some incident yeah, and two right. individuals working for a U.S. company uh, you know, they, they got injured and other trying to deny that. I just want to give you a chance to expand a little bit on that because we have mixed reporting. Yes, yeah, so, so I don't have anything other, uh, anything further to, to offer on that, on that situation other than to say that, that we remain concerned about the situation and we continue to urge the two parties um, to work together to bridge the, the remaining differences. Um, speaking broadly, I will say, as you know, as we spoke to yesterday, um, we do believe that an agreement is still within reach and we look forward to convening the two parties to move forward. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, nice, nice try. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make an announcement when we have one to make. Sir? Uh, yes, uh, let, me, let, me, let me go, Saeed. I'll come back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very quickly. Um, uh, Amnesty International is calling on the ICC to investigate uh, Israel for war crimes for uh, its attacks on Gaza last month. It says that collective punishment uh, was obvious, uh, an obvious result of that attack. I wonder if you saw the report, and I wonder if you have any comments. I will say as a general matter, we don't offer um, evaluations from the State Department uh, on reports or as assessments by outside groups. We have our own rigorous process for making atrocity de 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 determinations. Uh, and reports on human rights, which we issue globally through the human rights reports. Um, and I will also make clear, as we've done a, a number of times, that we support uh, Israel's right to defend itself. Right. But at the same time, we underscore, as we always do when this matter comes up, that all parties need to comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law. Yeah, but Syria, uh, Israel is really a serial bomber of uh, civilian places and so on. Let me ask you on an, an issue, a related issue. Today, the commander of the soldier that shot the two-year-old uh, boy said that he will not, he will spare, was the worst word, he will spare uh, the, the soldiers involved, the, any trial or, you know, uh, and he will only reprimand them. Is that, is that acceptable to you, that somebody shot a two-year-old boy and, and uh, you know, they get reprimanded? I mean, what, uh, what, what deterrence is, is there? for soldiers not to do that again. I, I will say, as I said yesterday, we continue to offer our condolences to the family. We always mourn the loss of civilian life, and we continue to look into the investigation into this matter. Can I just go back to your response to Saeed's first question? Yeah. <coughs> and this is something I've done with previous spokespeople going back to you know, 1999. It's simply not true that you don't offer assessments or talk about reports from outside organizations. In fact, in the human rights reports every year, uh, there are specific citations to reports from Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. The fact of the matter is, is that you don't talk about them when they don't serve your own interests. So if Amnesty or Human Rights Watch or Freedom House or some other group comes out with something that is critical of one of your friends or allies, you say you don't want to you don't talk about it. But when they come out with reports about China or North Korea or Russia or a foe, you're all over it. So please don't go with what? this, we never talk I, about I did, this. So, I, that's, just, so just if I, I'll, I'll speak to the words I use, which are as a general matter, we do not, there are always exceptions, of course. Oh, okay. <laughs> There ha <laughs> the exceptions happen to be when they're talking about people that you don't like. Go ahead, Olivia. Like. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, there's, there's word from CISA that several federal agencies have been affected by a cyber attack potentially involving a Russian group. Can you confirm whether the State Department is among those agencies and whether there's any remediation? Uh, I'm not aware of the State Department being one of those agencies. Um, 
uh, and I would refer you to CISA for more information on, on those reports. Okay, can I lob two more at you? Yeah. Um, one, um, the Russians are appearing to publicly signal a willingness to return to the New START Treaty. Can you say whether uh, that openness has been delivered in more discreet or official channels to this building? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, and uh, on Iran, we have on heard you, Iran. Iran. Um, we've all heard you loud and clear saying there's no deal interim or otherwise in the last several days. A lot of ink has been spilled. We've discussed it a lot in this room. Um, is it fair to say that there's been some momentum or movement in areas of mutual concern between the U.S. and Iran? I think how I would describe it is we have been clear what our Iran policy is and what our Iran objectives are. Um, uh, number one, we want Iran to take steps to de-escalate tensions, which of course includes steps to curb its nuclear program. Number two, we want Iran to take to cease its actions that destabilize the region, including its support for proxy gr groups that carry out attacks. Number three, we want R Iran to stop its support for Russia's war on, a, on Ukraine. Number four, we believe that Iran should release Americans who it continues to wrongfully detain. The wrongful detention of U.S. nationals and political leverage for, for political leverage is unacceptable, and we will continue mm -hmm. to work to bring every American who is wrongfully detained home. And I will say that we continue to use diplomatic engagements to pursue all of these goals in full coordination with our allies and partners. But as I said yesterday, with respect to um, uh, uh, Iran's nuclear program, there is no deal. The reports that there are a deal or some agreement or, or some other description, however you want to describe it, are not true. Sorry to retread ground. That, that, um, and, and as much as I would love to stand up here today and say, that we have an agreement to bring U.S. citizens home, U.S. citizens who have been wrongfully detained home, that is not the case. It is a matter that we continue to work, that we continue to spend uh, a great deal of time and resources trying to effectuate, and we will continue to do so, but I don't have an announcement of any, any uh, agreement to bring detainees home at this time. Absent an announcement and having clearly delineated all of those goals and objectives and desires on the part of the United States, would you characterize, is there a willingness on the part of the Iranians to move forward on any of those fronts that you just I, I will certainly, um, uh, not today and probably not ever, speak to uh, the motivations or desires or, 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 or uh, intentions of the, the uh, Iranian regime. What I will say is that our, our objectives are clear and we continue to work to try to advance U.S. objectives uh, in all of these areas using all the tools available to us, including diplomacy, but we are not yet at the point where I'm able to make any sorts of announcements. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Madam. Uh, the American Iranians who have staged a sit-in outside this building, they're in their 13th day. Uh, we do know that a, uh, an official from the State Department has already met with them. I was wondering if uh, Secretary Blinken has Notice them, ask about them, although their banners and signs, I think, speak for themselves, and whether he would be interested in meeting with them since uh, he has met with some um, similar activists in the past during the demonstration. Uh, I think I, it's safe to say that everyone who works in the State Department is aware of the demonstrations. We all drive by them or walk by them every day when, when we come into the building. As you noted, a State Department official did meet with them uh, uh, to discuss uh, uh, issues uh, in the last several days, and we will continue to gauge with them as appropriate, but as, with, as it pertains to, to the Secretary, I don't have any, any meetings to announce. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, stay on. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Having a deal regarding the detainees, you you said that you were pursuing diplomacy regarding this. Yesterday, uh, Omani Foreign Minister told and monitored that it, you are closer to a deal. Are you a step closer, at least? I don't want to characterize either our private diplomatic conversations or the status or the subject of con conversations that we have, other than to say that it continues to be an objective of the President, an objective of Secretary Blinken, an objective of everyone who works in this building to bring wrongfully detained Americans home. We are working on it 24-7, including with consultations with our partners and allies in the region, and we will continue to do so. But I, I, I don't think um, it's, it's either appropriate or really more to the point it's useful for me to try to read out the status or, or, or um, uh, where we stand on that work as it remains ongoing. I think one of the things you heard all of us say uh, from this podium and from various other places that one of the things we've learned about our work to secure the release of wrongful detainees, it's awful not helpful to talk about the work we're doing while it's ongoing because uh, it can jeopardize the, the, the effectiveness of that work. Uh, 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 
What are you doing so far back there? I'll come to you next. But go, you're usually up here. Go. Ahead. I'll come to you next, Michelle. A little, I'm a little confused seeing you at the back. that uh, inspectors from the United Nations nuclear watchdog, they found the traces that the Iran has reached 83.7% of the uranium, then which is 6% below the nuclear weakening spread. If the uranium is going farther, do you have any, any anything to do with them? Then how do you prevent Iran to not get 90% of Iran. I will say we cont it continues to be a top priority for us to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. We continue to believe diplomacy is the best, best path to achieve it. That has been our, our belief since the beginning of this administration. If you remember where we were when this administration took office, or I should back up and say where, where we were when the previous administration took office, the Iran Iranian nuclear program was in a box. Uh, unfortunately, the previous administration left the JCPOA and allowed Iran to continue marching forward to, uh, uh, in pursuit of a nuclear weapon. We have tried to pursue diplomacy to, con to constrain their efforts to acquire a nuclear weapon, but we have also made clear that all options remain on the table. But Iran is getting closer to the 90 percent of enriching uranium. Then if the diplomacy doesn't work, then how do you prevent it? Uh, I, I, I'm not going to, to comment any further than to say we believe diplomacy is the first option, but as I said, we retain other options at our disposal. I, I promised Michelle I'd come to him next. Uh, Matt, uh, two days ago you said uh, that Under Secretary Newland uh, has uh, talked to uh, Lebanese Speaker Berry and she thanked him for his willingness uh, to try to maintain a quorum and thereby hold open ele electoral sessions so that the parliament can select a president. Yesterday, uh, Speaker Berry has failed to do that. Are you still uh, thankful for him? Uh, I spoke to this yesterday, actually, Michelle. We were disappointed um, uh, by that outcome. Um, I, I will say that we continue to leverage all the diplomatic tools at our uh, uh, disposal to encourage the Lebanese political class to find consensus in electing uh, a president as soon as possible. Um, uh, we welcome the vote that took place, but are concerned, as I said yesterday, I'll reiterate again today, that MP MPs left the chamber to prevent further rounds of voting. Uh, after more than seven months the, without a president, the Lebanese people deserve more than a single vote. They urgently need a president who can enact reforms to unlock IMF support. And for this to happen, uh, we believe Parliament must continue holding electoral sessions in the coming days and weeks to get that job done. And do you consider Speaker Berry a U.S. Uh, friend or ally? Uh, I, I'm not going to speak to that question uh, other than to say we generally um, do not endorse or comment on any specific uh, politician, personality, or party. Out of respect for the uh, Lebanon sovereignty, we will work with whatever government the Lebanese people choose. And are you considering any sanctions against them? Uh, as a general practice, we don't uh, discuss any potential sanctions, but I, uh, I will say uh, the administration is, using, <coughs> is considering and leveraging all diplomatic tools at our disposal to encourage the Le Lebanese political class to find a consensus and elect a president as soon as possible. Abby. Questions on Americans uh, overseas. Um, do you have any comment on two Americans who were found dead in their hotel room in Baja, California, uh, Baja, Mexico? I think you must have come in late. You must have snuck in late. Because I, I, I answered that one a minute ago. Okay, apologies. So, no problem. Uh, in, in the other, there were other there were other members who I won't. Uh, other unnamed members who came who came in. Uh, there were other unnamed members of the press corps who also came in late. So I'm not I'm not shaming anyone. Thank you. What was India. The, <laughs> As far as U.S.-India relations are concerned, next week, today, the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Narendra Modi, will be welcomed at the White House by President Biden with, uh, following with the state dinner. My question is that Indian-American community has already started welcoming the Prime Minister and also U.S.-India relations in Washington starting on Monday, or actually yesterday on the Capitol Hill. My question is that recently, Secretary of Defense was in India, and then uh, National Security Advisor Mr. Suleiman was in India yesterday, just came back, and many other uh, high-level meetings were going on for the last six plus months and all that. My question is that how many remaining issues are there between U.S. and India that will be discussed or resolved or solved or will be uh, highlighted and plus uh, ice-breaking, or I should say that uh, how many um, you think uh, dealings or deals will be signed between the two countries during Prime Minister's visit? 
so I don't want to get ahead of the White House, who will um, uh, be hosting Prime Minister Modi, of course. Um, uh, they'll be making further announcements about the visit in the coming days leading up to, uh, uh, to the trip next week. I will say generally our partnership with India is one of our most consequential relationships. We look closely with India. Uh, on, we work closely with India on our most vital priorities. They play a crucial role in ensuring a free and open Indo-Pacific that is connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. And I know um, Secretary Blinken looks forward to seeing Prime Minister Modi and other members of the Indian delegation while they're here and working to make progress on all the issues with which uh, we consult with India. But in terms of any specific issues, I will uh, defer to the White House for comment on that. Just to follow, uh, of course, like you said, Secretary of State was there. He's very famous in India among other uh, leaders from the U.S. And uh, also at the same time, as far as diplomacy is concerned and cultural exchanges between the two countries, U.S. and India, as far as this building, uh, what can the Indians can expect from the U.S. as far as diplomacy and uh, cultural exchanges and immigration and visas and all those things? Because one issue is there in India when I just was there recently, when the U.S. will open for the uh, visas because many husbands and wives are stuck in, 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 in India and yeah. they are still waiting to come to the U.S. Uh, I will say with respect to visas, our consular teams have been making a huge push to process as many visa applications as possible in India, uh, including in those visa ca categories that are key to the bilateral relationship. This is a top priority for our government. We know that there is more work that we can do. Uh, and, and we are working hard to do it. With respect to the broader question, uh, again, I don't want to get ahead of the White House about what kind of announcements we might have related to the trip. Let do me go. Do you have a message yeah. for the Indian American community? I'm, do I, I'm sorry, well, I, I couldn't hear someone. Any so there's there somebody else talking in the front row. I'll come to you next. Sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Any message for the Indian American community on behalf of the Secretary of State and the new ambassador in India? Um, uh, the new, the new American US ambassador American. to India. So I, I've seen, um, I've heard that the new American ambassador, Ambassador Garcetti, is actually a bit of a celebrity in India as well. Let me just say again that our partnership with India is one of our most consequential relationships. We really do look forward to the visit next week. Um, uh, in addition to, to um, uh, hosting uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, at the White House, there will be a state lunch here at the State Department, uh, and we're all very much looking forward to it. Can Go ahead. Sir, sorry. How much? Uh, how much uh, land, what's the State Department official on? How much land is, has China taken from India? And will the Secretary be discussing the India-China relationships at all, or will it still to ahead of um, with, with respect to what issues the Secretary will discuss, again, I will just outline those broadly to say that the, uh, the Secretary will be really, as I said yesterday, and as, the, as um, uh, uh, other officials from the building have, have spoken to, um, we have a number of goals for the, for the trip to Beijing. One of those goals is to open uh, reliable lines of communication between our two governments to ensure that the, the competition between the U.S. and China does not veer into conflict. Uh, number two, there are a number of issues uh, where, where we have concerns. Uh, about actions the PRC has taken, and we will, of course, be raising uh, those concerns directly with counterparts uh, in, in the government uh, in Beijing. And number three, we look to, to uh, find areas uh, where we can cooperate. We think that's the expectation the world has of the United States and the expectation the world has of China. But with respect to any particular issue, um, I, I don't want to speak to it. I'm sure that we'll, we'll, have, we'll have plenty to say uh, uh, when the trip is, uh, is complete. And what's the size? Do you have? Do you do you have the size idea? How many square miles? I, like, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, yeah, go. I'll come to you next. Just to, just to follow up on the, on the Prime Minister Modi's trip, um, I just wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, you know, obviously, there's has been has been discussed. There's there's a lot of people in the um, Indian American community who'll be welcoming the Prime Minister. Um, there are also going to be some people who will, uh, you know, protest or want the administration to. Um, to raise uh, with a lot more priority the issue of human rights and democracy issues. Um, you know, we've had the, the the Modi government's actions against the BBC related to the to the documentary about him. Um, you know, there's issues of citizenship. There's a lot of these kind of issues which you would think that an administration that came into office saying, you know, human rights and democracy are at the centre of our foreign policy, that these would be, you know, at the top of the agenda. But you know, I think. A lot of people would, would looking at the way that uh, the Prime Minister is going to be welcomed here would say, you know, 
India's other, the, the importance of India is kind of superseding the concerns that, that, that you know, people would like to see you raise over human rights. So I wanted to give you a chance to respond. Sure. I, I would say, as I said in my previous comments, there are a number of issues uh, with which we work with India, um, uh, uh, as I outlined before, but that also we regularly raise uh, with Indian government officials at senior levels the, uh, our human rights concerns. We've been clear about that. We speak with them privately. We speak about those privately with the Indian government, and we speak uh, about them publicly. I, I will also say that with respect to um, protests, um, uh, we support the right of every American to exercise their First Amendment rights to make their voices heard. We just earlier in this briefing talked about a very vigorous exercise of the First Amendment right that's been happening outside our building for, um, I don't know, a week or two now, and we continue to support um, the right of Americans to, to, to do so. I, 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 told, I promised I'd come to you next. Okay. Uh, so the last two weeks, we heard many times President Biden mention the solar facility investment in Angola. One of the moments was when President Biden were, were having a press conference with the Prime Minister of UK, and recently during the reception with the US ambassadors abroad uh, mm -hmm. in other countries. So President Biden also mentioned again that he's very proud of this solar facility investment in Angola. So my question is, can we expect in the future uh, U.S. Uh, delegation travel to Angola to see this solar facility investment in Angola? Uh, um, when I mention the delegation, I'm referring to State Department yeah. official or even President himself, because he, he said he would travel to the continent. Mm -hmm. We don't know where he's going, when he's going, but can we expect him since he's very proud about this solar facility and he keeps mentioning, is he by any chance also planning to go and see this investment in Angola? So I will say that, that uh, uh, we all, of course, are very proud of that investment. I believe officials from the American Embassy in Angola have, have, um, uh, have spoken to the issue a number of times. But with respect to any presidential travel, um, uh, I don't have anything to announce. I suspect they would, uh, I, I would, uh, be in some jeopardy if I was started announcing presidential level presidential level travel from the podium at the State Department. Uh, go ahead. Uh, on Sudan, um, the fighting seems to be getting worse and spreading. Uh, why do you think the actions taken by the State Department haven't seemed to make much of a difference? And do you have any hope for a resolution in the near future? So I, I will say we continue to stay on, engaged on this matter, um, uh, both bilaterally and with our, our partners in the region, most chiefly um, the Saudi Arabia. We have been uh, uh, extremely disappointed by the actions uh, of the two parties. We continue to stand by the people of Sudan and urge the parties to end the fighting immediately. One of our messages has been all along, both directly to the two parties, and we've said this publicly a number of times, that there is no military solution to this conflict. Uh, the JEDA talks that were taking place um, provided a face-to-face -face opportunity to have a dialogue. We strongly urge the parties to take advantage of that. We were able to secure a number of ceasefires, some more effective than others, but ultimately the, the parties decided that they would resort to resuming conflict. Uh, I would say that, that um, uh, we continue to engage with partners uh, in the region um, and, and um, uh, continue to consider other options that are available to us. We announced a range of sanctions, I think it was week before last, uh, and we continue to consider other steps moving forward. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, from Airway News TV Pakistan. Pakistani uh, government and military have imposed a ban on the media coverage of former Prime Minister Imran Khan. Media channels are not even allowed to say or mention his name in the news bulletins and prime time shows. Um, this raises concern about press freedom and the role of government in, con in controlling media narratives. So would you like to say something about safeguarding the rights of journalists and the public's access to the information? Sure. I would say that we, we generally urge all governments to respect the role of journalists and media. We believe the press for, performs a critical function in democratic societies. Uh, we expect that journalists covering the, the events in Pakistan should all be allowed to do their work. Uh, a free and independent press is a vital core institution that undergirds healthy democracies by ensuring that electorates can uh, make informed decisions and holding government officials accountable. That uh, last part is near and dear to my heart as someone, as someone who personally comes before you to be held accountable just about every day. Sir, uh, uh, so one last question. What is the current stance of the United States towards Imran Khan? 
what is the current stance towards the Brown Khan. As he's recently in his recent he's a, interview, he's he, a private citizen. We uh, don't we don't generally have stances towards the prime, prime minister. He's continuing to say uh, he just said that uh, he claimed that defying U.S. policies led to his downfall. Uh, I would say that that we've spoken to this in the past. Those allegations are are absolutely false. Pakistani politics are a matter for the Pakistani people to decide pursuant to their own constitution and laws. Uh, they are not a matter for the United States government. Let me take one more from Saeed and then we'll wrap. Uh, thank you uh, on human trafficking, and I apologize for walking in the middle of uh, the ambassador's uh, briefing. Uh, you know, child labor uh, trafficking and child labor exploitation really have the same component a great deal of the time, and especially in conflict zones or zones adjacent uh, to conflict uh, zones. And, uh, you know, and sometimes a situation that can be really terribly exacerbated by the fact that sometimes the elder child is the sole breadwinner. I mean, I'm talking about real situation, as talk about Syrian boys and so on, that are in camps in Turkey and in Jordan. I mean, we see it day in and day out by the thousands and so on. So what measures can be taken, to, first of all, to ensure their safety, to make sure that, I mean, these countries are your allies, uh, to, to introduce maybe some labor, child protection laws and so on. Uh, I will you. say, first of all, we can, we, of course, and, and I wish you would have asked, asked the ambassador who could have given a, a much yeah. more complete answer. I will say the first thing that we do is to continue to shine light on the problem around the world. I think it's an, an important step that we take to release this report every year, um, mm -hmm. to, to call out um, uh, practices uh, around the world that, uh, that may not be up to appropriate standards, and we will continue to shine a light on those activities and work with uh, countries in the region to try and improve them. Thank you all.